Hi, my name is Brendan Kemp. I'm a consultant for Container Solutions. Uh, and today, welcome to my talk on GitOps in a regulated sector. So just to kind of give an overview of who I am. So I've been a consultant for around five to six years now. Majority of my work has been around helping moving systems to more, more resilient setups, right? More uh, easier deployments of software, etc. And uh, primarily at CS, it's helping enterprise customers move from legacy setups to more cloud native operations, which in today's time means I've been working a lot with Kubernetes. However, starting out, I was a Python developer. So today I'm going to take you through a bit of a um, use case at one of our clients, Deutsche Fiskal. So I'm not going to go deep into what Deutsche Fiskal actually does. Um, however, just understand they're in a, they're a type of Finco and they're working with uh, government regulations. So in terms of um, the actual teams that we worked with at Deutsche Fiskal, it was extremely small talented team, right? So two to three people who had to handle the infrastructure and operations of around 20 to 30 application developers work, right? And majority, majority of this work was around a Greenfields microservice project. So when at CS, the first things we do when chatting with clients is we go to the clients and for, you know, two to three days, we have workshops with them, understanding what they need, um, what's important to them. And after our workshop, these were some of the things that we thought were extremely important in their ecosystem. So having a, a quick look at things, you know, audible changes, who, who made, who changed the system, access control, who has, who has access to change a system, scalable infrastructure. They didn't know how much, uh, how much they were dealing with in terms of their customers. Um, security, any regulated industry has expectation of some kind of security, disaster recoveries, so rollbacks, et cetera. Collaboration was something that um, we felt was necessary, uh, a necessity. So uh, I will chat about that in a bit. And also stability across all environments, not just production environments. So after having a look at all of these, we thought this was a great opportunity to dive into a slightly newer methodology called GitOps, right? So a lot of people have been talking about GitOps, the use cases of GitOps, etc. And we thought this was a very good fit. Now, how does GitOps solve all of those problems? So for audible changes, I mean, developers have been doing commits for years, right? Your Git commits, uh, every commit that gets pushed to Git has your name against it, has a little reason why this uh, change was made. And for us, if we were to think of you know, our own experience where companies have come in and added extra change release processes, change release documentation, this just slows everyone down, right? So for GitOps, audible changes, there's no need to add any extra tools. Access control, very easy. What you can do in Git is pretty much your access, right? Who can create uh, pull requests or merge requests, who can create tags, who can review uh, pull requests and you know submit them etc and only the pipeline actually makes changes to the infrastructure or the applications and any of these branches that kick off these changes are protected so you can't push directly to uh, a branch that's going to make these changes so collaboration for us was super important specifically because of the size of the team right so if you have two to three people these people are not going to be able to handle the amount of tickets that 20 to 30 application developers are going to create, right? So for instance, if any application developer wants to scale up the size of a Kubernetes cluster or add a new collection to a MongoDB instance or something like this, this would have a process generally of the IT operation guys getting a ticket of some kind. They've got to go and delve into it and, you know, add the changes, et cetera, et cetera. They've got to deploy the changes. They've got to then ask the application developers if this is right or some feedback needs to happen, right? Now, in our setup, 
what we envisioned was this idea that application developers that had some idea of infrastructure, which is, you know, quite a large amount of uh, us nowadays, they would be able to create a pull request with their changes and all the operations team would need to do is to approve those changes and merge them, right? So this allows any body within the company to become a potential operations engineer uh, for changes that they would need. So security, security for us wasn't uh, hugely difficult in this case. So generally, if you're working with a Git uh, repo provider like GitHub or um, hosted GitLab or something like this, you'd need to worry about things like how they handle their um, cleanup of their VMs that run CI CD, how they handle their secrets, etc. However, in this case, we were using an in internal Git repo. So it was hosted internally on a closed network. Um, we were using the push model. Now, so using a push model specifically um, because we were handling infrastructure as well as application. So if uh, you know a bit about GitOps, you know you've got the pull model and the push model. Pull model is your system pulling changes from the Git repo and push model is your Git uh, repo, your CI CD pipeline pushing changes to the, um, to the infrastructure or the application, right? Um, and this doesn't really, uh, pull, a pull model doesn't really work when you're handling infrastructure because the infrastructure has to exist before you're able to pull, uh, to pull uh, the changes, which creates a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So also another thing was secrets, you know, database passwords, things like this. How are we going to store these? And we decided to go for um, encrypting secrets at rest in a Git repo and the pipeline has the ability to decrypt them and apply them or decrypt them and push them, etc., etc. Rollbacks, rollbacks became super simple, right? Reverting a change is as simple as reverting a pull request or a commit. So you just uh, change to a commit, push this, uh, push this, create a pull request, or you know you use get uh, get revert merge request or revert pull request uh, functionality, and this creates a new commit that you then need to take through all of your environments to test it, right? So. At worst case, this means that you've got to deploy to some kind of staging environment and then to production. Um, but rollbacks are handled as if you want to roll back changes on software. The DR strategy, if your system fails, everything's in Git. Your source of truth is Git. So in terms of this, and we did kind of test this uh, in terms of uh, spinning up a new environment, all you have to do is you have to switch out, you know, a project ID or a subscription ID, depending on what cloud providers you're using, uh, if you're using Terraform, and you need to then run Terraform apply or something like this. Database restoration isn't handled in this. So database, <laughs> database failover is always a strategy in its own because you need to know how to replicate data across regions, etc. So in order for us to handle this, um, we didn't actually look at database restoration right off the bat, but rather handle whatever cloud providers, the uh, data recovery mechanisms are there. Right. So scalable, reusable infrastructure, Kubernetes, Cloud Terraform. I'm sure we've all heard about these. So I'm just really popping through all of these because I want to actually get to the actual, um, our actual approach and design of the system. But one thing to take into account is what about stability, right? So stability in terms of a lot of company only means that production needs to be stable. But for us, we felt that all environments need to be stable. Now, the reason behind this is in, in a normal setup is if you've got application developers and you have operation engineers all working on the same staging environment, generally what happens is operations will want to test out a, t a change on staging. They'll bring staging down for a couple of hours. Application developers will then not be able to push their changes or test their changes on staging. And this creates a bit of a, you know, a bit of a disagreement between operations and dev. Operations are too scared to push any changes to staging because they don't want to affect dev, dev's work. And devs get upset with ops because of the slow turnaround of changes that they might require. 
uh, which again seems a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? So our approach to this was very simple. We were going to split applications and infrastructure into two separate repos. So anything infrastructure related, this includes uh, a couple of things and anything application develop uh, application specific also gets into its own repo. Now for the infrastructure repo, what we have is any components or services provided by the cloud. Now, there was a bit of discussion around handling databases in the application level because for us, we felt that applications should be able to create their own database as needed. However, we didn't really have the design or technology at this point in order to handle uh, this kind of setup. So we decided that databases would also be handled the same way as Kubernetes clusters, queues, and networking, right? And now for infrastructure, we decided to go for a little approach. Um, now, this approach, just, just as any framework uh, when you're dealing with an application, uh, you use something like, you know, Spring Boot or Django or something, you base your application on this framework. We decided to base our infrastructure um, flow on a framework called Kubestack, right? And now for the exact same reason as Kubestack has pretty much uh, solved a lot of problems that you get straight out the bat with GitOps, like setting up pipelines, setting up um, your Git workflows, etc. And one thing that Kubestack brings is this idea of an ops apps pair, right? Now the ops apps pair is nothing new. It's your staging and production setup. However, we're talking about this in an operations points uh, perspective. So you have an operational shadow copy of every component where the operations team can test things out on. And then you have an applications, uh, applications environment where the actual applications get deployed to and they use the components, right? Now, this, uh, this is quite hard to keep in uh, sync making sure that the operations is as close to the applications environment as possible. So we used another feature of Kubestack, which is how Kubestack sets out its uh, Terraform modules to inherit the config, right? So in this case, if we just briefly look at the um, configuration that Kubestack uses here, we have um, this, apps, uh, set, this apps block and this ops block. Now, uh, Kubestack sets up its Terraform modules to inherit configuration between environments. So the apps uh, block is pretty much your general settings or your setup of your environment. So in this case, we're looking at clusters. Um, your clusters, your apps cluster here will have a uh, auto scaling enabled with a min node count of one and max node count of 10 with a region Europe West and some node locations, right? So how we try and keep ops as close to the apps as possible is we come uh, we come with this idea of explicit differences, right? So in order for ops to differentiate from apps, you actually have to explicitly set specific settings that you want to differentiate, or else it inherits application uh, the application's uh, properties, right? So in this case, we have a max node count of one. So this operations cluster won't have auto scaling enabled because it'll have max node count of one and a mid node count of one, and it's got less node locations. However, it still inherits the mid node count from the apps uh, properties, and it inherits the region from the apps properties. So any changes you want to make, you have to be explicit about it. And this just allows for as little deviation between the two environments as possible, which eventually gives you something like this. So um, the top, you have your application environments. Um, so this also brings in this concept of we are splitting our application environments away from our operations environments. So in this case, our applications have a staging pre prod and prod environment, and this is all handled at the application uh on the application environment for the operations and operations has a direct copy of this what this is great for is the operations environment becomes like a smokescreen test of any changes so in terms of 
um, this very simple setup. So obviously we had a lot more components, but in this very simple setup, you can have this operations clusters, you can deploy agents to this operations clusters that can test changes to your databases, like is there data loss, um, is there downtime, is there I don't know a speed a speed up or slow down of changes etc and you can have a very good um, idea of whether your change is effective and does what it needs to do right and with our customer the understanding here is we have a pre-prod and prod environment that is actually customer facing so pre-prod would be um, a place for our clients customers to test changes uh, before they get into prod Right, so what does this give us? It gives us a manual testing environment for any changes operations needs to make without affecting application development, right? Which in the long run creates less downtime uh, because all changes, um, problematic changes are learnt in the operations environment and not in any application environment, right? So the operations at the end, they've got more confidence to make changes, they've got more confidence to experiment. Downsides of this cost, right? So I'm just putting as a note here that uh, this is infrastructure cost that we're talking about. So when you do trade-offs of this, your infrastructure costs will increase. However, the idea that you might not, not have your application developers sitting on the sidelines waiting to be able to deploy to an environment doing nothing, this causes costs as well as well as the idea of reputational costs. So specifically, as this is a Greenfields project, the clients that this company is trying to um, uh, trying to service, they have a very specific um, reputation they need to uphold. And as soon as your reputation is damaged due to downtime or something like this, this can have a huge impact, uh, financial impact on your company, right? When we approach this, we decided on a very simplified Git workflow. So if we take into account using KubeStack, using the Terraform uh, the Q modules that KubeStack uh, sets up, etc., this is the design of um, our Git workflow, right? So you create a very, very quickly, you create a pull request um, to the master branch. This spits out a Terraform plan where you can get some idea of what changes are going to be made to your uh, setup, right? Now, when you merge this pull request, it kicks off the pipeline to actually apply those changes to ops. Now, applying these changes to ops might break, right? So when you're working with cloud providers, you get these concepts of things like service tiers where certain settings are only available in certain service tiers. Terraform, when you spit out that plan, doesn't necessarily take these into account. And we have actually experienced this quite heavily in terms of the difference between basic tiers and standard tiers, right? So when we apply changes to ops, then we see that, okay, applying this setting to a basic tier doesn't work because um, it's not allowed in the cloud provider you have to upgrade your tier or something like this this is a lesson learned that can cause downtime for databases for uh, setups right now once we're happy that the changes that we've proposed in our pull request work in the operations this master branch also spits out a terraform plan to the actual application environment, so to the operations production environment. Now, this plan uh, will give us a good indication of any differences or changes that would be made to the apps environment. And when we tag our commit for release, so we've got this version controlled, every time we've happy with changes, we tag the commit and it applies the changes to the apps environment. Right, now, Onto the 11th repo. So the 11th repo is this idea. Um, it, I believe it was formed by Weaveworks in their GitOps. Uh, I mean, they're very big in the GitOps industry. This 11th repo is just a collection of all the microservices, right? The name comes from the number of the original microservices. So we had 10 microservices to start up, up, uh, off with, but this quickly falls apart when you add a new microservice, right? Because then you're kind of like 11 microservices and 11th repo, it doesn't make sense. So what does this 11th repo do? It collects um, 
because we're using Kubernetes, we've got all these YAML configurations that deploy the applications, right? And this 11th repo collects the current deployment configuration for all the microservices together. And this allows us to have an exact recipe of microservices that work together. Now, if we take this one step further, where we started tagging all the microservices with the commits of the Git, uh, uh, the Git commit that was used to build that image, this gives us a very good understanding of what is currently running in production or staging or pre-prod, right? So we had a bit of pushback of this because there's this idea that um, microservices are supposed to be independently deployable. And why do, you, why do you want to monitor the versions together? Because microservices shouldn't have dependencies. So for the first bit, just because your microservices aren't uh, are, are the the YAML is collected in the same repo doesn't mean these aren't independently deployable, right? Every commit deploys changes. So just because one microservice deploys a change doesn't mean that the next commit can't be from a different microservice that can deploy its changes. Um, microservices shouldn't have dependencies. Well, anybody that's been working on microservices for any amount of time understands this. Microservices have contracts with each other and sometimes these contracts are broken, right? Because we don't keep track of service A talking to service B. We make a change on the contract of service B that service A can't handle. So this is one kind of dependency that often happens to cause problems. Upgrade, upgrading of services internally like Postgres versions or something like this. Now, the next uh, level of dependencies is also your library dependencies. So any microservice that uses libraries. So if we're using Python here, your pip packages, if you're using Node.js, your node modules, you might update a node module that could break, um, break the service or break another service, right? Um, and sometimes you don't have full visibility into those changes. Uh, oftentimes developers are very stressed. They're pushing changes, they're upgrading packages, they're not reading change logs, um, etc. And these things happen now what our um what our thing allows for sorry what our our uh setup allows for is to manage these that if you do if this ever does happen you just roll back to the previous uh previous 11th repo state and your contracts are restored because the um images are uh rolled back now this idea becomes super tricky when you're using Helm, right? So we've at first proposed customize because, you know, having customize using GitOps, uh, GitOps tends to favor more declarative uh, setups, right? Where Helm, and don't get me wrong, I like Helm. I like Helm as a, two, uh, a tool. Helm 3 is amazing. However, Helm is not declarative. You still have all this templating where you're injecting values in and you're injecting these values at, uh, at runtime. These values are stored separately outside of these templates. It's always very difficult to understand what's going on um, in CI CD with Helm, right? Um, there are tools around it. I know Flux has, uh, or Weaveworks has a tool, Flux CD, I believe, or something like this. Um, However, we started hitting bumps very early on when using Helm, right? Another thing is your Git, uh, Git workflow. So the applications in this case used Gitflow. And now there's nothing wrong with Gitflow. But even the guy that uh, bought us Gitflow commented, if your team is doing continuous delivery of software, I would suggest to adopt a much simpler workflow, right? So <laughs> in our feelings, you have three branches at max, right? Um, two, if you can get away with it. This uh, Git flow had quite a lot of um, branches, quite a lot of merging here, merging there. And this made it difficult to map exactly to what environment um, everyone needed to go into. So the end result looked something like this. You have a, um, you have a Git repo where you have uh, continuous, uh, you, your microservices are continuously updating YAML manifests in this 11th repo. And this 11th repo is just a collection of YAML where you've got your image, 
is based off a commit of what the microservice uh, is at that time. Now, once you're happy with this recipe of uh, microservices working together, so these will continuously get deployed to the staging environment. Once you're happy with it, you know, you tag the Git repo and this will deploy to pre-prod. I mean, you can use regex tags. So, you know, pre-prod dash V1 something, this will deploy to pre-prod and prod dash V1 something would deploy to prod right and this just gives you a very nice continuously uh, continuously deployable environment so my final thoughts and lessons learned on this right so specifically when starting with GitHub, start with something basic start with uh, something that's been done before and build on top of it right so we chose a framework to build on top of and we uh, started building the customer requirements on top of this every system requires some compromises where you know your ecosystem might have some gaps overall we were able to achieve our goal now a couple of thoughts on this try 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 always use declarative tools as much as possible keep your work get workflow simple um you know start simple build on top and also more more genuinely this might not work for everyone this is not a silver bullet don't just use it because it's a new trendy word only use it if the shoe fits and then finally just a couple of resources uh, i wrote a blog post on this specific use case uh, there's kubestack i definitely recommend checking that out and weaveworks has a lot of great uh, information on GitOps. and i hope you enjoy the rest of DockerCon. thanks for listening